gambling, everyone's favorite degenerate pastime. The word itself conjures up images of depressed teachers moonlighting as dealers at blackjack tables, men and women pissing themselves at slot machines from refusing to leave their seat whilst in the thrall of losing all their money. And of course, the constant barrage of sports betting commercials anytime I try to watch a football game. Seriously, Vandals, DraftKings, ESPN Bet, BetMGM, whatever, all the other sketchier betting firms out there eat a bag of dicks. I and just want to watch my Denver Broncos lose. Is that too much to ask? I don't want Kevin Hart talk yelling at me or Jamie Foxx acting like 10 different characters during a commercial. Please just let me watch football in peace. Now, I'm actually not going to cover the recent gambling surge uh, due to the legalization of sports betting and sports gambling recently in the U.S. Uh, I highly recommend watching. John Oliver had a good video about it. One of my favorite YouTubers, Drew Gooden, made a video a while back. I'll link that in the comments. Uh, but I actually want to talk about state-sponsored gambling, which is the lottery. Now, lotteries have actually been around for quite a long time. We usually credit the first one uh, to England way back in the 1500s, think Queen Elizabeth. And the goal of the lottery is quite simple, right? To raise money to fund public work or public programs and offering a prize to incentivize people to enter. Now, what motivated this video was actually the recent news that the Powerball reached its record high, or I think second record high jackpot of 1.8 billion, motivating even a skeptic like myself to buy a couple tickets, you know, just on the off chance. Uh, but today I want to tell you about when it is profitable uh, or worth it to purchase a lottery ticket. And then the time Massachusetts actually messed up its lottery calculation and unwittingly created four profitable businesses that were premised on the fact of just buying lottery tickets in mass. I was also planning on including uh, some math or some calculations to show why you should always take the lump sum over the annuity when uh, if you were so lucky to win a lottery, but I think this video is going to be long enough as it is. If there is any appetite for that, let me know in the comments and I'll be happy to basically create an addendum here showing some math for why the lump sum is always better than the annuity. As a disclaimer, please don't take anything I say in this video as actual financial advice. The lottery is gambling, plain and simple. I think states tolerate it because it goes to, you know, good causes. And also the barrier to entry is relatively low at, you know, $1, maybe $2 for some state lotteries. Now, with that said, when is it actually worth it to buy a lottery ticket? And the answer is when the expected value of that ticket is greater than the cost of the ticket itself. So what is expected value? Well, in plain English, it's the average. However, I find when people kind of think of the average, they are just adding up numbers and dividing. So if I told you to find the average of the following numbers, two, two, four, four, I hope you would tell me three and you would be correct. And whether or not you're aware of it, the math that you are doing there is two plus two plus four plus four, which is 12, divided by the four numbers I gave you, which is where you arrive at three. And this math works when all the outcomes have an equal chance of happening, right? Think rolling a single die. And as a quick kind of side note here, the expected value might not actually be a value that you expect, right? For a single die, the expected value is 3.5, but that's not actually a die roll that you can roll, right? You can roll a one through a six. So when different values or outcomes have different probabilities of happening, we need to incorporate that into our calculation. So in math terms, the generalized expected value is as follows. And X is just the value, right? Think the die roll, while P of X is just the probability that that happens. And then we add all of them up over all possible outcomes of X. For my continuous distribution aficionados or freaks, right? Let your freak flag fly. Uh, your expected value looks like that. And now there, x is still just the value, but f of x now is actually a probability density function. And the interesting kind of paradoxical thing about continuous distributions is that the probability of any particular value is zero. We're more interested in actually kind of uh, integrating over an area to get the probability that x might be between two distinct values. Let's go back to kind of our discrete world and use rolling two dice together to calculate an expected value. So we have a table here of the probability of each die roll happening, as well as the value itself, right? Two through 12. So our expected value is going to add up the value of our die roll multiplied by the probability that that is actually happening. 
And in this case, we get seven. And what's actually pretty interesting about this is that seven is a possible die roll. And if that gives you any indication for why thing, in things like craps, uh, seven is what makes you crap out, it's the most likely roll to happen. So casinos know what they're doing. So let's kind of take our expected value detour over and back to the lottery. And we can use the expected value to assign a dollar value to any lottery ticket we buy. So let's use the Powerball as our example. Now, if you don't know, the Powerball draws five numbers from one to 69. And then there is a sixth Powerball, which goes from one to 26. And that is the red ball at the end. Uh, the order in which the first five balls are drawn actually doesn't matter. The Powerball will always order them from low to high. So basically, uh, it doesn't have to be drawn in the exact order that they actually do. And doing this quick math, uh, there are about 292 million possible lottery drawings. Uh, and I'm showing the math right up there. Basically, that is just kind of a binomial. We would say that is 69 choose 5. As you may have guessed then, the odds of winning the Powerball is 1 in 292 million, which is basically zero. Uh, but you still can win money even if you don't get all of the numbers. So you get a million dollars if you get the five uh, first numbers, but not the Powerball itself. You get 50,000 for four of the five numbers and the Powerball and down the list. Uh, the Powerball website actually gives you the calculations for how much you win. And then what are the odds of each of these things happening, which I'll put right here. And so when you take that lump sum payment, which as I said, you always should, you actually only receive about 30% of the advertised jackpot, and that is before state taxes are applied. And states are weird here. California has no state taxes on uh, lottery winnings, while others have higher rates. Uh, now, obviously, that is a huge chunk taken off the top, but whenever we're talking about you know, the Powerball or anything like that, this is life-changing money. So 70% is a lot, but you're still going to be a millionaire at the end. But we should actually use that actual payout then in calculating our expected value, not necessarily the sticker price kind of jackpot that we see. So as I'm filming this, the current uh, Powerball jackpot is about 145 million. So if we use our 30% kind of rule, you would take home 43 million if you won that $145 million jackpot. So then let's go ahead and compute what the expected value is using uh, that jackpot number. So here you can see the expected value of a lottery ticket is that 43 million uh, that I would take home as a jackpot divided by the probability of getting that, 292 million, uh, 1 million for getting the first five numbers divided by 11.6 million, uh, 50,000 for getting four of the five and the Powerball divided by its odds of happening, which is 913,000. There are other payouts, but essentially they don't really contribute much. Uh, so your expected value of a lottery ticket there then is 29 cents. So 29 cents. Uh, and remember, a Powerball ticket costs $2 to purchase. So basically what this is saying, for every $2 you spend, uh, you can expect to take home 29 cents, which is not a good investment at all, right? You're basically losing 90% of your money in doing that. But let's go back to when the jackpot actually got up to that 1.8 billion. So if we use our 30% rule, you would end up with about $540 million after taxes. And so if we update our expected payout with this new information, so now all we have to change here is instead of 43 million in the first spot, we just update that to 540 million. And we get an expected value of our lottery ticket actually approximately two. So like that, we have broken even. Now, obviously the big kind of question here is, well, it's not like as if you buy one ticket, you're going to get $2 back. That's not how it works, right? What this means is that uh, if you mass buy tickets, and that really is kind of the crux of the problem here. If you mass buy tickets, each ticket has an expected value of about $2. So the more and more tickets you buy, the closer and closer you should be on average to about breaking even. Uh, and really that bulk buying the tickets is the real game here uh, that I'll talk about in the cash windfall lottery. Hey, Max from the future here. I have this idea to show you how as you increase the number of tickets you would buy, uh, you would actually closer and closer approach that expected value. And as I went through this, something didn't really make sense. And I'm sure it's obvious to some of you, but basically in that Powerball expected value calculation I gave you, winning the lottery of 540 million is really doing the heavy lifting on that expected value. And so just to kind of quickly show you what I've done here in R, 
is by brute force and obviously for those of you that know how to code you'll see that this is the worst way of doing this but I've created basically a huge sample of all possible calculations and winnings dollar values associated with this so basically there is winning the 540 million dollar jackpot there's uh, winning the million and there are you know so many combinations to do that on and on and on and then of course the rest is you are going to get zero a whole bunch of times uh, and so then what I've done is basically created a group of, imagine if you could buy 10 Powerball tickets at a time, and we do that a thousand times. Imagine you could buy a thousand at a time, and we do that a thousand times. Imagine, and this was inspired by uh, the group that you will see later that at most bought 700,000 tickets in the cash windfall. Imagine you could buy 700,000 tickets a thousand times, and in each of these cases, uh, I have replaced here as false when we are doing this sampling to basically say I'm buying distinct lotto tickets so I am never necessarily redrawing the same thing twice. What's happening down here is I've combined all of these into one thing so this column right here shows what happens of those 1,000 samples of 10 draws uh, you see that on average actually we only get about 18 cents on every two dollar investment in the lottery even though we know the expected value of this should be uh, two, and it's actually a little bit over two, but I'll show you in just a second. Same thing, when we are able to buy a thousand tickets at a time, the average is about 23 cents. Now we got lucky, and we had uh, one ticket that basically gave me a 50, or I had one sample that gave me a $50 return per ticket. That is a huge outlier. Uh, 700,000, same thing. It is increasing our mean higher and higher, but still, basically what's happening here is that winning that jackpot is so rare that it basically isn't happening even if I'm able to buy mass amount of tickets many many times uh, it's actually still a losing investment which is quite surprising so uh, the moral of the story here is take expected values with a grain of salt in this case the jackpot is doing the very heavy lifting and let me just show you that my numbers make sense here uh, if I very quickly basically just say what is the mean of my x vector you'll see I get 2.1679. So actually, this is a positive expected value uh, lottery, but basically what's happening here is that that first uh, thing of winning the jackpot is doing the very heavy lifting. And that actually then is a perfect segue. So the cash windfall, uh, which was in Massachusetts, was introduced in September of 2004. And generally its purpose was to get people to participate in the lottery. The prior lottery that they had introduced produced no jackpot winners, people left in droves, they wanted something else to really encourage people to play. The structure of cash windfall is actually quite similar to the Powerball. Six numbers were drawn, except these six numbers were drawn from 1 to 46. Uh, I'll show the math here, but basically we would write that as 46 to 6. So the odds of winning the jackpot here were about 1 in 9.3 million, and I should also say then each ticket also cost $2, just like the Powerball does today. Now, what made cash windfall unique was that it actually had a capped or a maximum jackpot. So whenever someone would win, the minimum jackpot was half a million. And then obviously, as people did not win, the jackpot went higher and higher. And then the maximum was actually just $2 million. But the critical part is that if no one won that $2 million jackpot, the lottery would roll down, and this is their terminology here, into lesser prizes, increasing the payouts for those who got anywhere from three to five of those six drawn numbers. And I have a table here uh, that gives you the odds, and then it gives you the roll down for a particular day. And so this would then be unique to the number of tickets, but you get the general idea of this massive increase in payoffs uh, that happen when no one wins that $2 million jackpot and the roll down occurs. And this roll down is actually the key to what made cash windfall profitable. So let's go ahead and calculate the expected value of a lottery ticket when that roll down occurs. And so here in our expected value calculation, uh, you know, we're actually not going to include winning that $2 million jackpot in the thing because the roll down only happens if that $2 million jackpot goes unclaimed. So that $22,000 payout, uh, that is getting five of the six numbers. That occurs, uh, you know, one in 39,028. You can see the math here. I'm not going to spell it all out, but actually that leaves the expected value of a uh, cash windfall ticket on a roll down to be $2.14, which remember is larger than the $2 ticket price. So basically, this is a 7% return in expectation uh, for every ticket you buy. 
And so people did this math and they noticed that roll downs provided an opportunity to make money. And so businesses were created as a result of that. Uh, there were four groups of people who basically uh, participated in the mass buying of tickets when we had roll downs. Uh, the first one was made up of MIT students led by James Harvey. There was one in Michigan. And the interesting thing about Michigan is actually they had a lottery there that was just called Windfall. And it actually was kind of the inspiration for Cash Windfall in Massachusetts. Uh, this one was led by Gerald Selby, a group at Boston University, which was led by Dr. Yun Zhang, and then a group at Northeastern led by Wen and Chong. And each group, basically their strategy was quite simple, buy thousands of tickets and try and uh, cash in when a roll down occurred. Uh, most groups would buy tens of thousands of tickets. The high end is the MIT group usually bought around 300,000 tickets. So that is $600,000 spent when a roll down was expected. And the amazing thing is that this was actually consistently profitable for all of these groups. I know that you're thinking, well, if you're mass buying tickets, all it takes is one person winning the jackpot, the roll down doesn't occur, and then all of a sudden the expected value of the ticket goes down. That is true, but in all of the times of uh, these groups buying tickets in mass, only one jackpot of $2 million was won, and that was from the Northeastern group. Uh, they won the jackpot in 2008. So they were all aware of each other and they actually tried to engage uh, in some gamesmanship, which is what I want to talk about right now. So uh, the MIT group, basically they did some math and they discovered that if the jackpot was just under 1.6 million, if that went unclaimed, there was an intermediary jackpot, which would you know, be anywhere from say 1.7 to 1.8. Uh, and if that one went unclaimed, we would then hit the max jackpot and that is where the roll down would occur. So if you have that 1.6, intermediate jackpot, and then they would decide to start buying in mass. And so what the MIT group did is they actually preempted this. So they waited for the jackpot to be just under 1.6. It went unclaimed. And then instead of waiting for one more cycle, they actually mass bought tickets uh, to trigger a roll down before the other firms could react. And when they did this, so this happened in August of 2010, they implemented this very clever strategy preempted a roll down, the other groups did not mass buy tickets, and they actually monopolized the profits. So, and to do this, they bought 700,000 tickets. That is more than double of their normal 300,000 they would normally buy. And so this triggered the roll down. They basically placed a $1.4 million gamble and they profited by 700,000. So they earned a 50% return by being able to block out the other groups and creating a roll down when the others were not expecting it. And what's interesting is that they actually tried this again in December, so four months later, uh, but as a result of this earlier tactic of mass buying tickets to try to trigger a roll down before other groups were expecting it, the lottery actually put in an early warning system to warn the other groups that a roll down was likely, and therefore the other groups were able to react and start buying tickets in mass, essentially mitigating the advantage that uh, the MIT group had. So that was the only other time they tried it. A early warning system kicked in and the other groups caught wise to their strategy. Uh, so as to kind of put a bow on the story, the cash windfall game was discontinued in 2012. And this mostly occurred because in 2011, there was an article published in the Boston Globe that highlighted what these you know, four groups of people were doing. Uh, and this created bad press for the cash windfall. And the reason wasn't so much because, you know, people were participating. It was wildly successful for the state of Massachusetts, generating a ton of tax revenue, um, but basically highlighting that there were some groups who had the purchasing power to buy tickets in mass, trigger the roll downs and then profit off of it. Uh, it made it seem like they were kind of the big guys against the little guys who were just buying, you know, one or two tickets and ultimately not profiting as much as they should have. So when that happened, the state decided to shut down uh, the cash windfall program despite its success. So. There you have it, a way to calculate when a lottery turns profitable, and then a story about people who used that same math and they turned it into tons of cash. Now remember, with great math power comes great math responsibility, and hopefully a little bit of money on the side. So use this carefully, but again, please do not take this as actual financial advice. Uh, this is a fun bit of trivia, and hopefully maybe you can use expected value uh, to calculate monetary values of things in your life. So let me know if you enjoyed this video in the comments. Let me know if there's anything else you would like me to cover. I'll see you next time.